morning. Good it's good to see you all. Welcome to uh, Prime Time at the BU Library. I'm Keith Brooks from the Education Department, but I'm here as a faculty development representative. And uh, today, in partnership with faculty development and the library, and with Jay Rasmussen, uh, we will, he will be sharing overcoming obstacles to using engaged learning strategies, which is part two of the series entitled Strategies for Increasing Student Engagement for a Talk About Teaching Session. On next to or after our spring break, on March 22nd, that Tuesday, we will welcome Dr. Robert uh, Frickenberg, uh, Professor Emeritus from the University of Wisconsin Madison, for a special lecture co sponsored with the History Department entitled Living with Islam Christians and Muslims and Historical Perspective. Prime time at the BU Library's mission is to encourage lifelong learning beyond the classroom for faculty students and staff and those presentations which are a collaboration of many different offices on campus with the friends of the BU Library. So let's welcome Dr. Jay Rathman. If uh, some folks are coming in, I, I think you missed, there's a small handout you know, right on the table there. So if you want to grab one of those, that would be great. Thanks for being here. Two days before spring break, um, you clearly are the people that are dedicated to education, care about your students. And, no, seriously, I really, really appreciate you. Either that or you're a personal friend of mine, and you just are here for that reason, too. Yeah. But, uh, thank you so much for, for being here today. Um, this is um, today's workshop, like he said, is going to focus on obstacles to overcoming. Uh, engagement of students, and then you can see the other two sessions that will be coming. Um, one particularly with the idea of kind of interactive lectures, and then another, kind of our final one, uh, how to really get students involved in, uh, in content area tasks. You know, how to really help them get out of that task work they need you know, to support the learning process. Um, so that's what's, uh, that's what's coming up. Um, a little bit later in the session, I'm going to have you do a little partner share thing. So I want you to get comfortable with your partner here. So I'm going to actually make you uncomfortable right away from the beginning here. But let's um, <clears throat> let's do something that I call a current a current teaching temperature reading. And here's how this goes. What I want you to do is think about how your teaching is going right now. I don't mean necessarily this minute, but you know, the last couple of days or so. And I'd like you to assign yourself a 10 if you feel like your teaching is just amazing. I mean, it's just going really well. You repeatedly have students um, standing up in your class and applauding you. I mean, and just, uh, I mean, they're just excited about it. Um, that, you know, that would be a 10 category. You've got the whole teaching thing figured out so well, the whole grading thing figured out so well. Your biggest problem is, what do you do with your free time? You just don't know what to do with it. I mean, you've got this teaching thing figured out. Um, so that would be a 10. Uh, give yourself a 1. You know, if it's just really not going very well, you're teaching right now. For example, if Jay Barnes may have just contacted you about the budget crisis at Bethel, he's asking you to give back some of your salary because they've identified some of the really bad teachers at Bethel, and you kind of fall into that category, so you'd be a one. Or maybe you've got Matt's, I'm going to pick up Matt here, maybe you've got one of Matt's recent messages about how we're going to change over to a little bit better learning management system. You know, we're kind of done with Moodle now, and we're going we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna to move over to Poodle. Right now. Just, uh, just, just a whole lot better. And by the way, the transition will be really easy to you know, going from Moodle over to Poodle. But anyhow, that'd be a one. I have an announcement like to make that. after this is all done. <laughs> okay, so think about where where you would place yourself, kind of on that you know that one through ten continuum. I'd like you to talk to the one other person that's close to you. If you need to turn around, and that might be somebody next to you. But what would you give yourself now? Ten is that it's just going well. One, it's pretty horrendous. You know, where are you at with it? You're not currently teaching. You can. Just use it in the context of life in general. How is life in general? Okay, so I'm going to give you a minute or two for this. Not sit too long. So why don't you go ahead and talk to me? I get there, I get an expert, 
was in what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. I used to have one class. So I'm up there in front of class at like 10 minutes trying to get this thing started. So, classroom. so in those days, you go out and you go, oh, uh, you know, yeah. 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 If you're just coming in, don't have one of the handouts. You want to pick up one there. There's a yellow post-it note. We're going to use this a little bit later. If there are any notes you want to take today for any reason, you can put them in the right side. Today's going to be a little more discussion-based, I think, probably than the first session. Um, as always, the handouts, there are certain strategies that I'm making reference to. For example, a temperature reading has an assignment. It uh, has a number one connected to it. That number one relates to um, the larger handout that the, the four-part series is based on. Uh, this was given out the first session. If you don't have one for some reason, I brought extras with me today. So at the end, uh, just grab one. Uh, also, if you'd like it electronically, just contact me too. So anything you see on here that has uh, kind of an italics with a number after it, I'm trying to use one of the strategies that's in here. I'm not teaching how to do any of these strategies. They're pretty well explained, so we're kind of dig in a little bit, a little bit beyond that then. Yeah. Okay, um, I do, I do want to start with what I'm just going to call quiz time a little bit. Um, we had a number of people um, that are here today that were at the first session, so I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here, and uh, let's just take a shot at three questions. Let's do that. So can you remember what any of the critical attributes would be of how we were defining active learning? Do you remember any of those pieces to it? Somebody starts off. We gotta move fast. What do we what do we mean by active learning? I call it engagement, but what do we what do we mean by it? We feel really bad here if somebody doesn't pick up something here. So what uh, what do we mean by it? Good listening? Was that one? Um good start. We're up to we're up to a start here. Thanks for not shutting me down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so reflecting on experiences. Is this coming back a little bit, maybe now? Okay. Anything else that we're really need? Maybe active participation or participating in mm -hmm. experiences or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're getting those. Actually, I think we've got 
probably the two pretty critical parts. Yeah. The students that have a are in a state where there's a readiness to learn. Okay. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's just take a look real quick. We we drew a contrast between the passive learning, the active learning. And real simply, we just talked about there are some there's some experience component to it, and it could be the doing of something. It actually, it could even be the observing. And then, uh, kind of like Robin was talking about, there there was that reflection component. And we talked about uh, the real. I think the critical parts of that are that the student has time to reflect alone on what their learning was, but also some time to reflect with somebody else, you know, on what they're learning. And this is really what DFINK is defining as, uh, you know, as active learning, kind of those, you know, those two components. I prefer to use the term engaged learning, and I'll tell you why. Because I think when people hear active learning, they automatically picture that someone has to be in this small group and they have to be standing up and doing something. Or they, they think automatically it has to look active. I prefer the term engaged learning because I think someone can be fully engaged and they may not necessarily be actively, you know, doing something. On the other hand, I've seen students that I that are active. I mean, they're doing something, but were they really engaged, you know, with with the learning process, or were they just going through the motions? And then you find out later on that they really took very little from that experience. So to me, the real key is that whole engagement piece. Somebody somebody can be just sitting there, like I'll just pick on Jim for example. Uh, he could be really engaged with what's going on. I think he is. I see the wheel spin in there a little bit. Uh, and he's doing absolutely nothing. You know, but that engagement is really taking place. So that's, that's what we're after. And that engagement could involve the active participation. It could involve writing, talking, you know, all those things. But the key is that mind. You know, is it engaged with the learning? Okay, let's try, let's try a second question here. Okay, so based on what you already know, too, what, what is the role of short-term memory? You know, what is, what is that about? So. I'll just remember things for a short time. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're oh. off to a good start again. <laughs> 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 it's leaving pretty soon, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, also short-term memory. We talked about it's not a very efficient space. You know, kind of holds on to seven things, plus or minus two at any one point in time, but it has a really critical function. Okay, jump in. I know we got a lot of people that know a lot about this stuff, too. That's just me. Okay, let's go. What holds something in memory long enough so you can engage with it in a more mm -hmm. way? Yep. And they say roughly 18 to 36 hours. Something's with you with short-term memory. <laughs> <laughs> not terribly long. Yeah, you can okay. rehearse it. All right, she's jumping to question three now, too. But, but short-term memory, you know, one of the functions is the shifting of things over to long-term memory. Mm -hmm. you know, that's part of what happens with that. There's something really critical that happens with short in short-term memory, too. It is. It's really, we, it's really where we go through a lot of our decision-making process. It really happens with short-term memory as well. And, uh, you know, we can... We can kind of think in these terms a little bit too. We had looked at this model before, the idea of the information processing model. So it's responsible for setting things to long-term memory, retrieving things, you know, helping make decisions. And this is really an oversimplification, but you know, I think it's a, a good start. Um, so is short-term memory also where you start making connections to other things that you know that are relevant? Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. The, to me. Probably the two big pieces are just that, you know, sending and retrieving the long-term memory and helping you make connections to figure out intelligent decisions. There's a really interesting piece that just came out. I'll show you the article if you're interested in it. I don't normally cite Newsweek as a scholarly source, but uh, Newsweek, this is actually the last March issue. It's a fascinating article on brain freeze, and I'm just going to pull a couple pieces from that. When, when people have got too much kind of overloading short-term memory, it really does interfere with that decision-making process. And uh, you can just see a couple examples. The research, the base of the research comes from the Center of Neural Decision-Making. And the whole basis of this research is that we have got people that can't turn off the flood of information. And they literally have so much going on in short-term memory that they wind up making some poor decisions because they've not had a chance to really process, you know, everything that's there in some way. Certainly heard about this as well. 
They call those folks that just can't turn it off, they call them sufficers. I mean, no, those are the sufficers. They do have the ability to say, all right, I've taken in enough information, it's time to do something with it here. Maximizers just continue to take it, take it, take it, sometimes make poor decisions. We as teachers, I think, have some control over this as well, too. Uh, we can clearly overload our students' short-term memory in a very short amount of time. And that's when the glazed looks start to come in and all of that. Okay. All right, so question three then. So what are some of the practices then that are going to increase that likelihood, you know, things shifting over to long-term memory? We've heard one by Cheryl here. What would be some other ones? We went through quite a few things last time. Any kind of rehearsal and reflection. Okay. So that reversal in particular? Yep. How about some other ones? What can we do as teachers to help make that shift? Provide a, a, uh, an avenue for application. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing some use of it. Help Good. students connect to, like you said, your prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. Create a network. Yep. Keep going. When, when members rehearse at the college level, when I try that, it feels like kindergarten <laughs> or primary school, and I almost feel like I'm condescending to my students. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm doing it right now, right? I, yes. I am doing it with you right now. Yeah. I think the key is that, that it look a little different than it looked the first time. So it's meaningful repetition. It's the repetition, but it's a little different, you know, each, each time on. They do appreciate the practice, I think. When you start rehearsing some things, you're also adding emphasis to certain things. You're telling them very subtly, this is a pretty important thing. You know, we should hold on to this in some way. Yeah. Any others? I'll just show some real quick. You're also helping connect them in multiple ways, so there's a richer and network. Exactly. Retreat. Yep. So you're building those connections. For sure. Yep. Okay. Well, here are a couple of things we looked at, and I, I dropped the sources off these. But anytime they see the importance of what they're studying, absolutely critical. And there's research behind all these. The meaningful repetition, not just repetition, not just the same thing over and over again. It's got to be a little different. It's got to be meaningful. When we chunk information, you know, versus giving just scattered bits and pieces of information, the brain does not store things efficiently that way. The more we build connections, the stronger it's going to be for students. We talked, remember the discussion last time too about, about emotion? A lot of recent research showing how critical that is. And it's not just any emotion. You know, it's once you start getting things like fear in there, intimidation, embarrassment, you know, that can be pretty destructive. Then we talked about the dual coding a little bit too. Short-term memory is really capable of handling double the amount of information when it's presented verbally and, and visually. And then just the whole motivation piece. They can be really motivated and, and by inspired enthusiasm, particularly of people that are important in their lives, not just any people, but important people, really critical. And then this is pretty recent research now. We always talk about having students review things. It turns out that there's a lot more engagement when there's some kind of little quiz, some kind of little test, and it could give students to each other, it could be something you do. But the amount of engagement you get in a quiz or in a test is greater than a student just sitting there trying to review material. Pretty interesting one. Yeah. And then this is one we looked at too that I think got some, some interest last time as well. Yeah. Okay, so some of those things. Okay, so let's let's put it back on kind of you. You all obviously are sold on the idea of trying to engage your students or you wouldn't be here, you know, today. What I'd like you to do is think about just for you on a personal level. What are some of the obstacles that you've encountered when you try, you know, it could be some of these strategies that we have here, or other strategies you try. What are the obstacles that you encounter? And those obstacles could be student-based. Those obstacles could be something that, you know, that relates to you and your course, things you need to accomplish. It could be that. So I'd like you to take your post-it note if you could. And I'd like you to write down for you what you honestly feel is one of the biggest obstacles to really using active learning strategies you know, on a regular basis. Write fairly large, and I should warn you that somebody else is going to have to read this too. Okay? So try to write less if you could. Oh, 
Jotting down some of the biggest obstacles with the Uh, once you have yours written down, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to physically post it on yourself someplace. So Molly's going to put her someplace. So you're going to physically post it on yourself. Then what I'd like you to do is get up and just start moving around and looking what other people have. What I want you to do is make at least one exchange. Okay, so I might look at what Molly has. I might look at what someone else has. I'm looking for something that is also a concern for me. It doesn't have to match what I've got, though. But something, you know, I've got my own idea, but something, yeah, you're right, that is, that is kind of a concern for me. If she thinks mine is a concern for hers as well, then we're just going to do an exchange at that point. So I want you to make at least one exchange. You can make more if you'd like. And as you're walking around, I'd like you to look for some things. Like, what are you seeing quite a bit of, you know, as you move around here? Okay. Any questions at all? Okay, why don't you go ahead and move around when you're ready. At least one exchange. I wish I could give you more time for this too. What themes did you see? This was not about the Well, hopefully it's more than this buck too. I'm glad it is. Okay. Unwillingness. Unwillingness. Okay. Student resistance. Okay, so student resistance. 
Okay, let's get let's get maybe right. three things here. Okay. Um, well, I I exchanged with somebody else who had a similar concern that was balancing the need to cover content huh. yeah. with the engaged learning strategy because they take a lot more time. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then there's the prep time to put the engaged thing together. So. Okay. Let's get maybe, did you see one more thing? I want to force it, but did you see anything else that was pretty I, common? I certainly, um, and it said the comment was the fear of being wrong, like asking students to actually say something out loud to um, respond to fear of being wrong. Okay. Did you see that? Any other places at all, too? Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you saw a lot of? Okay. Let's um, let's start with let's start with Ripley maybe. You know that one. Um, it was just kind of the idea that um, how do you balance your content goals? I mean, you've got a lot of content. Every single discipline in this room with, um, and you have a finite amount of time. And any time you use an engaged learning strategy, even as this post-it note is changed, it takes time you know, to do that. So I'd like to ask you, how do you, how do you think about that? Everybody in here has struggled with that. You know that when you use any engaged strategy, it is going to take time. Right? So how do, you, how do you rationalize that use of the time? How do you, how do you think about it? So let's just hear from some people. I've got ideas on it, but I'd like you to jump in. There's a clear value. I mean, just the feedback you get from the students, whether it's on the final evaluation or whether it's that day. I mean, there's just this energy that um, that always exists, I guess, when there's active learning, and that's what I, I mean, it just seems like an inherent value. Okay, so use the word value. So the value was it brings an energy in some way, other values you see that it brings. It takes time, so it's good we're getting some value from it in some way. She also suggested that the feedback, you know, when you give any sort of assessment like this, this is in a way, you realize they don't know half as much as you think they know. So it's very valuable information. Okay. Okay. Desires McGinnis is quoting online, but if you're going to like cover, if you're only going to cover something, you might as well dig a hole and cover it because it won't be remembered. Okay. And we've all been there. We've all, man, we've all, we've covered it. We covered it, and we thought, man, I did my job. And then if you go to find out how much they really took away from the experience, it is pretty humbling sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Bob? Okay. I expect students to have a certain handle on time. So you're counting on meeting some of your content goals through reading things that take place outside the class, which would apply to any discipline. I think along with that, uh, the cover versus active, and I'm looking at the educating the net generation uh, challenge for me is reconceptualizing yourself from the sage to the facilitator and realizing that the value, that they are picking up valuable knowledge and content knowledge and applying it often in those settings as opposed to just sitting and receiving. And that this generation appears to want to do that more. Mm -hmm. Really want to engage with the material. Yeah, because they can access information a whole lot quicker, more efficiently online you know, than they can than they can from you. But I, I think part of our role, part of our responsibility is to figure out what is really critical in what we're teaching and and try to engage them, especially at those points. You know, not everything we teach is of equal value. I think you need to make those decisions as professionals that know the field as to where do I really want to invest my time and their time. Um, one, one way I think about it, I just started this thing to recently, I almost think um, as I'm preparing a, a lesson or preparing a course, you know, what are the things that are really the must, the must items? in a given day that I might have, a 50 minute class or a four hour class or whatever. Then I think, what are the things that would be great, you know, that we really should, they really should get an understanding of this, and what are the good things? And then I think to myself, for example, this session today, I would say some must things are that we recognize what some of those obstacles are, you know, that we can kind of generate some thoughts on how to deal with it a little bit. And then, like today, for example, I've got some should things, you know, 
you know, people should walk away with some understanding of some of these. And then, you know, I have a good one as well, too. So what I've started to do is, is in a sense, pare down almost the amount of stuff I teach, but really think intelligently about what are the non-negotiables, what are they really need to take away from this. And then with those non-negotiables thinking, how can I best engage them, you know, in that, you know, in that process. And I like to think, and I like to think with the approach that if I were to pull my students as they walk out the door, you know, that I would hear something somewhat common to them. If I were to ask them, what did you get out of today? You know, what did you really learn? And it's, there's going to be variations, but I would really hope that, that I'm hearing a lot of those must things as the students walk out the door. When I first started teaching, I was a cover it kind of a guy. I mean, I came through a doctoral program, knew a lot of stuff, and then I wanted my undergrads to know everything I knew in my entire doctoral program. And, uh, and I'm, I'm sure if I pulled them walking out the door, like, what did you learn today? I'm sure I would hear just a huge variety of different things, oftentimes, like, I'm quite sure. But, uh, but I think with this approach, it, it just adds that focus, you know, on, on what some of the really critical things are. Um, I do think that our goal as instructors is really the idea of, of really hip, helping our students take those isolated bits of information and really develop bodies of knowledge, in a sense. And when we're able to bring focus to our instruction, to what we have them do, I think we've got a greater, a greater opportunity to really accomplish this. If all we want them to do is assimilate information, find information, I guess they can do that pretty efficiently, you know, other, you know, other ways. Okay, how about other thoughts on this one? You know, the idea of, you know, you have a X amount of time. You do have content to cover. Other ways you think about like that approach. I don't know if Can I just ask uh, what that's from? It says page six, chapter one. Yeah. It. It's actually the book. Is okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Other thoughts on approaching this? I think Robin's point is a really key one, too, that we've got to count on other sources to deliver information for students. Often those other sources are as good or better than we are. I, this is, I'm tipping my hand here, but I think our time with students really needs to be about processing that information and really digging into it, you know, at some point. And that's, that's where we're pretty, pretty valuable in the process. Other thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, last semester, what I, in terms of expecting them to have come in and that they know what they were supposed to have read, and, and I'd ask them to do some reflection on it before they come and ask them, what do you think was most interesting to you of what you read? And then I do, the, my goal is to give processing time in class. Uh, the word I got back was it was just too much. You know, we had to do these writings every day. But then they said, okay, so then I got the midterm feedback. I cut back and they said, that was good. But then I found that I didn't keep myself accountable to the reading. And they were clearly not as prepared for the class period. So uh, my question right now is where's the balance for them and for me? Because it's a lot of grading, too, yeah. and keeping up with daily yeah. written responses yeah. so that we can process the information yeah. in class. Yeah, I think our fourth workshop, we're going to focus on the whole content, kind of, or the whole text-based thing, which is how we really come at that. Let's get to the second issue here. Um, and that was the idea that we do have some students that don't buy into this. You literally have students in your class that um, their learning style matches perfectly with the lecture. They would much prefer that you put together a very coherent 50-minute lecture, you know, have good PowerPoints, and just kind of go at it. And they honestly learn quite well that way. You have a number of students like that. You have some that feel this is just fun. These are little fun games that run around our post-it notes and that kind of business. Um, you've got other students that think, all right, how much am I paying to go to Bethel? I want to hear this person that's got a doctorate talk about this stuff, not some fool that's sitting next to me. You know, that's kind of what they think sometimes. So, but how do you how do you think about that? Because honestly, that's how that's what they're thinking a number of them. And then you've got the majority of them that are fine. They just engage and you know they're they're into it. But you do have resistance, you know, from a, a part of your student population. How do you process that? How do you think about that? 
Jay, I tried that seeing if I'm really stupid, dude, and if I just raising your hand, okay, on a scale of one to five, how many of you found this new information or challenging information? And so they would they would show the rest of the class where they were at. And so they saw, mm, well, I maybe thought it was like this, but my, my colleague, my peers in the classroom were in a different place. So I guess this is valuable if I want to think of this as a us rather than a me. Okay. Found that helpful. Oh, I'll still come I've okay. done um, trying to sell it in a way with how we practice science. I draw the parallel to what we do as a scientist every day, and so we're going to structure our class like science work. And part of that involves interacting with other people and um, really trying to use the tools of our discipline. And that seems to be the students say, oh, this is valuable. It's not, not a club. I think even explaining to some degree to your students how the brain works, and they've all heard this, but explaining to them that the more engaged you are, the greater the depth of processing of the experience, the more you're going to hold on to it. You know, part of my job is to think what's really important in this class, and then to engage you as fully as you can with that. And you're more likely to take that learning away you know, from the experience. So explaining to them the method behind your madness, you know, does it makes sense to them. I, I can physically see some of them. All right, that makes sense. Yeah, I'll kind of go with this game. Okay, how about other ways of thinking about that? That resistance is there. Other thoughts on it? All right. Um, let's, let's pick up on the last one a little bit. And that was kind of the idea of um, students have fear. Um, I think a student's number one fear in your classroom is that they're going to be embarrassed in some way, that they're going to be made to look kind of foolish in front of their peers. It's a huge fear on the part of students. It really is what holds them back often from interaction. And it's why the start of semesters are a fair. Because nobody wants to talk. Because they don't know what you're going to say in response to what they're doing. They don't know if they're going to get laughed at in that class. So you continually are trying to build that environment of some kind of trust and respect, you know, so you can get there. But that is that is the fear that they often have. So, kind of other ways to think about that, maybe? Ways to set it up where that's not going to be holding it back. If you have problems with your normal in yeah. your oh. L1 and your language, yeah. imagine trying to engage an intermediate or intermediate level in a foreign language. Um, so, the students, one of the things that came up, they actually said, uh, they have been socialized to 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 be to fear to be in class. Mm -hmm. So they, and so all of them when they heard that, you could see they all just there was just like uh huh, and everything, and the level of anxiety just just went down. Mm -hmm. So it was something that I I, I tried to, to this semester to talk to them about. Yeah. You know that well, yes. So maybe and I actually share an experience that I had with a teacher you know, how she did it when I was growing up. So, so, so for them, that's something that try, I try to be aware of, and it, it has to be that picture. Yeah, and I think, I think too, just starting off with partner kind of things, they're much less threatening, uh, and then maybe going to threes, then maybe to fours. But every student you have that walks into your class, um, they, they soon assume a role in your class. Some classes they walk into, they pretty much sit there and take notes. And that's what they assume their role is. Other classes they can walk in, they know they're going to have to talk a little bit. And they, they will do that, you know, oftentimes. So I think you establish kind of the tone of the class day one, you know, in probably the first 15, 20 minutes. And if you, if you allow them to experience some engagement with a partner, small group, with even a little bit with the whole group, they get into a habit there. And they, they walk into your class and say, all right, I've got to talk today. And most of them will, in a sense. But starting very non-threatening, very short, with partners, threes, and then going to some whole group stuff. But you want to get that habit established right at the start. That, hey, I talk in here, and it's OK. You know, I'm not going to be ripped into by the teacher or by other students. Okay. I also think, I had a question. You don't shoot for those one-right answers. You're going to put them out there in the park. Mm -hmm. You know, you let them practice that. Those are rehearsal kind of things. That's not what you do to, to put them on the spot so that they know in an ever-changing information technology world, they may not and 
usually is a point right answer. Yeah. So the point is processing. Yep, exactly. And use the word rehearsal. So if they can write something before they have to talk, that's rehearsal for them. They feel much more confident, comfortable. They're going to sound smart you know, when they start responding. Sarah, come into it. No. Okay, sorry. I, uh, I try to build an environment that says the classroom time is a practice time. We're going to practice in here and practicing getting feedback. And this is what you're paying the big bucks for. <laughs> is I really kind of appeal to that. Um, so I talk about it. This is practice. And you practice, you know, how you're coaching, you get feedback from your coach about shift your stance a little bit or try this kind of game or whatever. And then I, I laugh at myself and have fun with them and try to build that atmosphere, <laughs> which sometimes I put out and sometimes I don't. Or humor can be great as well. Yeah. Okay, just one quick thing. I wonder how um, people feel about using electronic discussion forums, too. It, it also works a little bit with the time saving piece, but I think it also. You know, it, pro it provides an opportunity for students to think, to post thoughts, and dialogue with each other. But it's maybe a little less. Uh, you have time to, to, to create, pre prepare it ahead of time. You have time to edit what you're thinking. In, in, in with Lauda's comment, you have a second language learner, especially. Maybe that's an effective tool. Sure. Yeah, it's probably the single biggest advantage of online learning is just that chance to to bring depth to your comments because you've got that rehearsal time for you. Yeah. We're running out of time. Um, hope they had a little bit of a chance to kind of think about um, think about a few of these issues here. If you could, I, I would like you to talk with your partner a little bit about and kind of what we were just talking about today. Could be earlier parts, could be latter parts. You know, anything today that impact a little bit of how you think about what you do, or maybe how you practice, and it's going to be probably a probably a little thing. We've a short amount of time here. But what what's what is sticking with you in a sense? Okay. So if you could just talk to your partner with that, and then I think we're gonna just adjourn right at that point. When you're finished up with your partner, uh, just feel feel free to take off. But what what's sticking with you? Okay, we give Jay a hand.